I'm Betty Swan, and welcome to our show, Wisdom in the Night, where you get help for those tough decisions in your life. Tonight, I've got a great guest. She is a wealth management advisor. Welcome, Samantha Zungry. Thank you, Betty. Boy, you're young. How in the world did someone as young as you get started in something like that? Uh, well, I've always really been interested in investing in business. So even as a teenager, I was um, investing in friends and relatives, business ventures, with or without a return on my investment. But I just always wanted to be independent that way. And uh, I started dating Jonathan, my husband, when I was in college. So this is about uh, when I was 22, nine years now. And growing up, my parents were always very, very generous. So the way I saw financial management growing up, it was really, if the Lord puts on your heart to give, no matter what number that is, no matter how crazy it is, you give. So we had a hypothetical conversation one day, me and John, and he said, if God gave you $10 million or you won you know, $10 million, how would you spend it? And I went first and I said, well, I'd give $1 million to this and $1 million to that. And I went until there was only one left for me. One million left for One you. million left for me. Um, and I think it was to be split between myself and my brother and my parents, something like that. <laughs> and after that response, he looked at me like I was crazy. So I said, what's wrong? He said, that's not how you manage money. And I said, what do you mean? If God gives you that much money, you just bless other people with it. And he said, no, if you invest it, you can bless all those people and many, many, many more for a much longer period of time for the rest of your life. So that really got me thinking. So this was almost 10 years ago now. And then as time went by and Jonathan and I um, were together longer, my father-in-law, Barry Zungri, who started a Fortune 100 company in the 90s, a tech company in the 90s, um, he really poured into me. I, I think he probably sensed that I was interested in learning about investing and managing money. And he probably also thought, you know, if my son is going to marry this girl, maybe she should learn a thing or two about managing finances. And I just drank everything in. I, I loved every minute of it. And he made us sit in um, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And I just loved every minute of it. And I knew about John and I knew he had, you know, this nice apartment and I knew of obviously where my in-laws lived, but I didn't really know the actual financial situation until Jonathan and I got married. And then shortly after we got, well, no, actually shortly before we got married, Jonathan made it clear to me, um, this is what I have. I want everything to be merged, which is I still don't understand because I barely had anything, but he was very incessant about having one bank account and one everything. And he said, what I have is not for spending. So Jonathan grew up as a missionary kid. Barry and Terry, my in-laws, were missionaries for a long time in the 70s and, and throughout the early and mid 80s, and they were very poor. And they lived in Amsterdam for a while, but they were around the country, around the world, actually. Jonathan grew up being a missionary kid all over the world. He has the best stories, but he watched their family go from very, very poor to quite wealthy because his dad was called by the Lord into business and blessed him, really, really blessed him. So he said Do to you me, think the Lord blessed him with business because he gave so much to the Lord to begin with? I know that Barry, he never dreamed of being rich. He never really wanted money. He just wanted to serve Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that could be why God blessed him because I just Lord know didn't. it says in the Bible, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken, shaken together, together, running, running over. over. Well, mm -hmm. the Lord give back and he uses men to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people think it's wrong for Christians to have wealth. But yeah. if you read the Bible, yeah. just about everybody we think is a big hero in the Bible had great wealth, mm -hmm. but he managed it right. 
Exactly. So the Lord has uh, a love for people from every level of society. He doesn't have favorites and he doesn't see one over the other. But it also says in the Bible that God gives you the power to get wealth and yeah. that he expects you to do the right things with it. So it's yeah. not that you get it and you blow it all. I mean, you, you're saying you learned that, right? Yeah. Uh, my The verse that I have, I have built my business on is um, Deuteronomy 8. Chapter 8, verse 17. What is that? Uh, you may say to yourself, my power and the work of my hands have made this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to create wealth. Mm -hmm. So from so after we got married, I knew that this was a responsibility now that God had given me to manage real wealth. Um, so I took that responsibility really, really seriously and I educated myself and I'm a sports science major. My first experience of managing wealth was from being Jonathan's wife. So I just went the extra mile. I, I read books. I, um, you know, watched po or listened to podcasts, everything I could do. So at the age of 25, when Jonathan and I got married, I had all this knowledge about biblical financial management. And I said to God, Lord, this is so helpful. If only people knew about this, it would bring them so much more freedom financially. And I don't know if you want me to use this in the kingdom. Uh, I ask for a sign if you do. And I don't usually ask for signs, but this is the one instance where I said, Lord, if you do want me to use this for the kingdom, mm -hmm. um, I asked that someone in church would ask me to do something, speak or whatever, teach, whatever it is. And true enough, shortly after that, I was asked to teach Crown. So I've been teaching Crown. Now, what is Crown? Crown is a seven week study where uh, we're taught exactly what the Bible says about money. There's 2,300 verses in the Bible about money and Jesus speaks about nothing more than he speaks about money. No, it's, and it's because our life is run by money. Yes. Like it or not, it is. Mm -hmm. You got it. It's great. You don't have it. It's bad. Mm -hmm. And even a lot of verses that we wouldn't think in the New Testament that we wouldn't think actually speak about money do speak about are pertaining to money indirectly. So I was able to teach, uh, have been able to teach this class and people that were taking the class wanted to meet with me individually to come up with a plan on how they can save, how they can pay off their debt. And I found it really fulfilling to be able to take the time and meet with these people one by one and walk them through that process and see them go from bondage financially to freedom financially. So I started to think, wow, this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. But my frustration was I didn't have the licenses necessary to be able to recommend the specific products that would work for them or uh, investment methods that would work to achieve the goal that they had. Um, and then fast forward to 2000, late 2015, Jonathan got an opportunity to go back to work. I mean, to go back to school for free. And I was in sports. I was still in sports as a triathlon coach. And I, I prayed and I said, Lord, if I'm going to be the one that is bringing home the bacon for the both of us at this time, show me if I should stay in sports or if I should go back to finance. And previously I was in foreign exchange. I was working in foreign exchange for possibly the biggest bank in the world internationally. And I said, because if I go back to finance, I'm not going back, I'm not turning back. I'm gonna give my life to that. So show me where you want me to go. And he miraculously, it's a long, wonderful story how he opened the door for me to have a place in the firm that I work at now, but I decided, you know, this is what I want to do. You know, that's a really important thing that you just said about, Lord, if you want me to do it, show me. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't realize how, how much God wants to be involved in your life in helping you prosper and helping you have what you need to have to live a good life. Mm -hmm. I don't think... Uh, poverty is a good thing, but I think a lot of people struggle with it. Yeah. A lot of people, maybe mm -hmm. most, you know, a huge number of people, because I travel all over the world and I just know America is so rich. I, the poorest person in America yeah. is rich compared 
to the rest of the world. Yes. And, and if you don't travel, you don't know that. Yeah. But at the same time, there's got to be somebody in your life that does what you do, that, that they can say, look, I can help you get out of debt. Mm -hmm. So what would be the greatest piece of advice you would give somebody to get out of debt? Live simply. It's of all the things I've learned about managing money and managing money God's way, the most profound yet the most simple piece of learning that I've found is the way to build wealth, the, ba the way to get out of debt is to live simply because most people will also you know, elevate their, their standard of living when they make more money. The way you really become a great saver is by living simply, spending less than what you earn and saving money. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple, yet it's so hard to do for most people. Well, the, the, one of the greatest pieces of financial advice we got when we we're trying to get out of debt and, and get on the side of all of the good side um, was practice delayed gratification. Yeah. In other words, everybody around you is getting a new car. Mm -hmm. Everybody around you is getting a bigger house or, mm -hmm. or anything. And so rather than go that way, just do without mm -hmm. and wait. And in time, you will get it, but you'll be in a better place. Mm -hmm. And that really helped us a lot. So many ways to save money. You just have to be creative. So for one, Jonathan and I realized, you know, we don't really need cable. Things like that. So we got rid of cable. We found other ways to find entertainment through the, the television. And we pay more like $8 instead of 120 every month. Uh, we found out that we could get internet for free. So it's not the best internet, but it's still free. So instead of paying the $100 a month, we get it for free. Little things like that. And we go to, um, I don't want to name it, but we go to a, a very unglamorous grocery store because it's just much less expensive than... We do too. Yeah, the Whole we Foods. We do the same thing. Yeah. The Whole Foods, that's closer to us. Yeah. So little things like that. It's an active decision to live a simple life as opposed to even what you can, what you can afford. What would you advise a couple if, say, one of them wants to do it and the other one doesn't want to do it? Great question, because John and I, you know, you probably gathered this early on, we had very different money values coming into our, our marriage. And like I said, my parents were all about giving exactly what God said you would give. And he was taught you manage money well, because if you do that, you can bless more people, even if it means not always giving out when you feel like it. Um, so holding off so you can build more wealth, so you can bless more people. Um, so we fought so much in the beginning of our marriage because I felt like we could give so much more, but we're not. And he felt like, well, we need to be stewarding this because clearly we didn't work for any of this. So after years of fighting over the same thing over and over again, we spoke to you know the wonderful Bruce Ho, who said, you guys have to set aside whatever knowledge you came into your marriage with concerning financial management. And you have to ask God together, separately, pray separately, but ask him what he wants you to do, how he wants the both of you as a couple to manage his wealth. And that really helped because it put us on the exact same page. Yeah, that I've never heard of anybody saying that. That is very, very wise advice. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to ask you about your background a little bit. You grew, Did you grow up in America? No, I grew up in Manila in the Philippines. Okay. I moved here when I was 21. All right. So just 10 years ago. So really, in that 10-year period, your whole life has changed in yeah. a significant way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, oh, how yeah. did the, how did, have you always walked with the Lord? Did, how yeah. old were you when you got that going? I grew up in Sunday school. I grew up serving in church. My family was always that family that did everything, was there, you know, an hour before the service, served in the choir, everything. Um, so in my Christian upbringing, it was really about serving God by, you know, being consistent in the things that we did in church. So. My dad is short of saying, you know, if you're not dead, you're going to church. Yeah. Um, but how did you get a person? How old were you when you got 
your own personal walk? So I found uh, a Christian fellowship, a youth Christian fellowship when I was 13 that was not in the church. And I just got filled with God's presence in the Holy Spirit. So I started going to that. And that, you know, years later, not immediately, but that opened up the way for my parents to also go to the same evangelical church. So I grew up Methodist slash Protestant and um, very different from the charismatic evangelical church. But I found this other church that was really, really spirit filled. And I started going and at first my dad didn't like it. He thought the people were weird because they were raising their hands and, you know, singing out loud. Uh, And it took four years. Uh, They didn't start going to the same church until I was 17. So you just hung in there on your own. Yeah, I well, just now it, a it lot. seems to me that you're an independent woman who's working closely with her husband, and where you've had arguments, or you actually were both so di- on different ends of the page. Yeah. Uh, you have figured out a way to come through. But you mm-hmm. seem happy, but uh, I know people watching this are saying, "But have you ever gone through any kind of hard challenges? Have you?" Have you? Yeah. Uh, I want to say 18 months ago, uh, in late 2014, um, our best friends, who were a couple, the guy was a pastor and um, obviously pastor's wife, they divorced and it was very messy. It was really messy. Um, it would have been messy outside of the church setting. So being in, you know, that um, scenario made it even more just scandalous, I guess is what you could say. Um, And that felt like a nightmare. It felt like waking up every day in a nightmare and asking yourself, "How, how is this my life? I had nothing to do with this, but somehow I'm right smack in the middle of all of it. And watching all of our closest relationships disintegrate because of people feeling differently about different things. So not only was our relationship with them changed, but the relationships of people around us not only changed, but, you know, we're destroyed. And um, we, we found ourselves in a position where we knew much more about what was going on than everyone else, even the other authorities in church, way more. So we found ourselves kind of lonely because we really didn't have anyone to talk to. And at the time, I was 28 and, you know, John was 33. And I thought, I'm 28 years old. I have no, even now, even today, I have no wisdom, no knowledge, no experience to deal with any of this. How am I smack in the middle of everything? Because what happened was the, the, the wife left and I was kind of the liaison between her and the church and the congregation and our friends. It was just it was absolutely terrible. And um, a, there's a lot more um, to it. That's like the basic uh, scenario. But it was really difficult. And I actually ended up in um, depression and therapy because my friend, for some reason, felt like what I had given to her was not enough. So there was a combination of uh, mourning because I lost my friend and rejection, I guess. Only now am I realizing that I felt really rejected after everything that I gave. And my one prayer through all of that was that I'd be able to face Jesus at the end of my life and say, and he would he would verify it, that I gave everything everything I could in that situation and I did to the point that you know I ended up in therapy so no regrets but it really did feel like a nightmare every single day how long did it take you to get over that I remember a few months ago maybe four or five months ago so this would have been a year and a half after the incident Walking down the street and thinking, I can think about it, but I don't feel like there's a knife in my chest anymore. And so this was, what, a year and a half, you're saying? 
Yeah, maybe even two. Yeah. yeah. The reason I'm asking that, a lot of people go through something so very traumatizing and difficult, and people around them say, after a few months, get over it, get over it, go on. Yeah. And yet you're saying a year and a half or two years later, you and with help from therapy. With help. So would you recommend people getting therapy when they've been through something that they really didn't bring on, didn't have anything to do with it, and yet it affected them so profoundly? Definitely. Um, I've always had a problem with addressing and managing my emotions because I just didn't grow up in a household where we confronted things like depression and, and anger. I never really learned how to manage those, those feelings, so I couldn't ever express, even to my own husband, what I was feeling in, the time, in that time. So therapy helped, well, counseling, I should say counseling, help because it pulled those ugly things out of me and helped me to see them for what they were and therefore, you know, accept them for what they were. But it, I, I'm a firm believer in counseling. John and I will always go to someone for help when we find that we keep hitting the same walls in our marriage and there's nothing wrong with it. No, you know how I look at it. Uh, Counseling is another word for wisdom, right? Mm. And you would go and get wisdom. You yeah. get wisdom from a doctor. You mm -hmm. get wisdom from a professor. You get wisdom from a boss. Mm -hmm. So why in the world wouldn't people get wisdom for their own personal issues? Why? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't even make sense to me because I've always been uh, willing to go. I've always found the people to go to. Mm -hmm. And, if, and uh, for myself, I can say if you try somebody and they don't seem to help you, don't give up. Go find somebody else. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think what keeps people from doing it is because they don't think that other people are going through. They think they're the only one that's going through that situation, and therefore they're strange or, you know, they're more evil than the next person or more messed up than the next person. But it's really not the situation. I think you'll find that if you go to a counselor or even open up to someone about what you're going through, you'll hear that there are other people that have gone through the same things. And so there is a collective body of wisdom and research even to help you in what you're mm -hmm. going through. All right. Now, I want to ask another question about this. So here you have this traumatic thing going on and you're young. And at the same time, you have your career going on and all that you've just been telling us about mm -hmm. that. And then were you an athlete, too? Yeah, at the time I was a triathlon coach. So when all of this happened and I went into depression, I wasn't doing anything because I would lay down on the couch for four hours and just cry. So I really wasn't training. I wasn't functioning emotionally, especially socially. I actually stopped going to church for a while because I was so afraid that people would ask me how I was doing. And you're what, you're afraid you'd start crying? I just didn't want to be asked you know, are you okay? I was just so sick of everyone pitying me um, that I didn't even want to show myself to people that I knew anymore. Um, so John and I found other ways to <laughs> fellowship with the Lord in that time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God healed me. All right, so since this is a show with Wisdom in the Night, I'm sure there are people watching this right now in the night that are in depression or mm. and thinking, but she looks happy. So how did you get happy again? It's the best question anyone's ever asked me because this is the thing about my life that I love sharing the most, this one story. There was one evening I was sitting on the corner of 42nd Street and 6th Avenue, so arguably the most busy intersection mm -hmm. in all of New York City. And you know, a million, of pe million people passing me by, and I, d I was sitting there thinking, wow, I feel so disconnected from all of these people, and yet we're all so close in proximity. And that's because I was so depressed at the time, but I had never felt Jesus more real inside of me. I couldn't function, you know, socially, but at the time, I didn't know how else to pray because there were just no, I couldn't even tell the Lord how I was feeling. So I prayed the Psalms 
And you see, like I saw all the, the verses that I, I had highlighted in the years prior, and they're always really encouraging psalms. But this time, the ones that I was highlighting, the ones that I was really praying were the ones where David's like, God, if you don't save me, I'm going to die. <laughs> and those were the ones that really... And so depressed. He was so yeah. down. So the Psalms really helped me to express to the Lord what I was feeling. And that's why I, I feel like I ended up so close and intimate with Jesus in the time, in that time, even when I felt so removed from the world. So that I look back on my depression time as the time when, yeah, life itself was just absolutely miserable, but I had never experienced that kind of intimacy with Jesus. And you know what? I don't want it to happen again, but I'm willing to go through it again if it means experiencing that again. That oh, I Lord. think I could say the same thing about the bad things I've been yeah. through in my life. I wouldn't wish them on a dog. Yeah. I wouldn't wish them on <laughs> my yeah. worst enemy. Exactly. Yeah. But I like what I became out of it. Yeah, same here. Yeah, and a lot of times people mm -hmm. say, well, so did God do that? No, no, he didn't do that. What he did was walk beside you and, and you became very close with him. Yeah, and that changed me from a very, very deep level inside out. And what happened to me in that time is I was broken. In every sense of the word, I was broken. But then I just came out better. And in that time when John and I were going through that, the Lord, uh, the word that the Lord gave us was that he was deepening our well. Wow. Well, you know, I want to tell all of you that are watching this, I'm sure you have really been helped by Samantha's story. I'm sure it's been very encouraging to you. And there are those of you right now, I sense you tuned into this show and you were right ready to give up, weren't you? And now you have hope again because Jesus loves you so much. He wants to help you in this horrible thing you're going through. Now you've got to tell him, Jesus, you've got to help me. I just need your help. I don't know how to do this. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. It wasn't an accident that you turned on the TV. And I hope you received some wisdom and that you have a great rest of the night, whether you're going to sleep or you're going to work. I'll see you next time. Bye.